Okay, so we're going to start off by looking at section 4.3. Um, this is the last section that we're going to do on rational equations. So remember, rational equations are things that generally look like that. Okay, there's an example of a rational equation. And we've done all kinds of things with them. We found like, the end behavior. We've done asymptotes. Uh, we did a little bit of sketching in section 4.2. In 4.3, any sketching we do is going to be on the calculator. So no sketching by hand. And it's mainly going to focus on solving for the variable algebraically. Okay. Um, when we get to doing some inequalities, that's when we're going to use the calculator. But most of the equations that we do, um, those will be algebra. So that's, that's what we're going to do today. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to set up um, the problem ourselves. And it's going to involve the distance equals rate times time formula. So if you don't know uh, that formula, that is something that we're going to need in this section. And that formula says that if you take the distance, or to calculate the distance that you travel, it's the speed that you're traveling at times the time. Now when we talk about speed, we're going to just use like average speed, because a lot of the times when you're driving, your speed fluctuates up and down. So we're just going to base speed off of an average number to make it simpler. <clears throat> One thing that we're going to have to know how to do, though, is rearrange that formula to get t by itself. To get the t by itself, you'd have to get rid of the r. And how would you move the r to the other side? Divide. Yeah, we divide each side by r. So that's still the distance formula. It's just a different way to write. Time is distance divided by rate. All right, any question on that? All right, so let's look at our, um, our first problem. So this problem is going to be about um, somebody traveling. And they're going to use two different modes of transportation, a train and a car. And it says Sue drove 30 miles to the train station. And then from there, completed her trip by train. She traveled a total of 120 miles. And we don't know the speed of either vehicle. All we know is the train is 20 miles per hour faster than the car on average. So we basically want to find a formula that's going to represent the time it takes for her to do this trip. Bless you. So when I'm done, I want a formula that you could just say the speed of the car was 57 miles an hour. I can fill 57 into the formula, and the answer I get will be how much time it takes for her to do the trip, taking into account everything that's, that's up there. So the first thing we have to figure out is just kind of a general idea about the formula, not, not even plugging into it specifically, but just, just the general kind of big picture. How many different modes of uh, transportation is Sue going to use in this trip? Yep. Two, two. Two. She's going to use two different modes of transportation. So in order to find the total time for the trip, what are we going to do with the time she spends using each mode of transportation? Yeah, we're going to have to add them together. 
So what's the first mode of transportation that Sue uses? The car. The car. So the first thing we have to do is figure out how much time does she spend driving the car. So we'll do the time in the car plus what's the other time that we're going to have to add to that to get the total time? The time on the train? Yeah, the time that she's in the train. So that's not a algebra formula. It's kind of the big picture of what we need to figure out. The time in the car plus the time on the train. So any question on that idea? Okay. So, um, first thing. Let's figure out the car part. Now, we don't have any times in this whole problem. There are no times given. But we can find time by using that formula. In order to find the time, what can you do if you want to find time? Yeah? Um, divide the distance by the rate. Find the distance by the rate. Okay, so let's figure out the time she spends in the car. Find the time that she's in the car. We're going to take the distance she travels in the car, and we're going to divide by the speed of the car. That'll give us time. What's the distance that she travels by car? 30, 30, miles. 30 miles. Now we need to divide that by the speed of the car. How are we representing the speed of the car? X. It says let X be the speed of the car. Yeah, that's all we know. We just know it's X. Now that's the time, because that's the distance divided by the speed. All right, now let's do the same thing for the train. I need the time that she's on the train, so I need distance divided by speed again. What's the distance that she travels by train? 90. 90 because she did a total of 120, but 30 was by car. So 90 was by train. And now we need to take the distance and divide by the speed of the train. X plus 20. X plus 20, yep. So that is a formula that if you plug in the speed of the car and do it out, you'll get the time it takes to do the trip. Any questions on the, um, on the formula? Now, right now, we have it as two separate fractions. To do some of the things we're going to need to do, we're going to have to add those fractions together. But in terms of answering the question, find a formula, we've, we've done it. All right, so we'll come back to that, and we're going we're gonna to do something with it in a minute. All right, what they want us to do now is to find some asymptotes, some zeros, some roots, the EBM, and sketch a graph on the calculator. Now, some of these, in particular the EBM, um, you need to combine them together as one fraction. If you want to take two fractions and put them together, what do you have to have? Denominators. You have to have a common denominator. So just off to the side, just kind of review that real quick. If I wanted to add these two fractions together, okay, I'm just going to do an example with numbers. One way to find a common denominator is to multiply the two you have together. What are the two denominators that I have? Five and seven. Five and seven. That is one way to find your new common denominator. What is the denominator on the left missing so that it has the common denominator? It's missing the time seven. So you're going to have to multiply the top and the bottom by the other denominator. 
what's the denominator on the right missing? Being multiplied by five. It's missing being multiplied by five. So you're gonna multiply the top and the bottom by the other denominator. That's how it always works. You multiply your fraction, top and bottom, by the other <coughs> denominator. So now let's try that here. What do you think the common denominator here is gonna be? X times what? X plus 20. Yep, you can just leave it like that for now. So it's XX plus 20. What is the denominator on the left missing to make it the common denominator? Can you multiply by X plus 20? It's missing X plus 20 in the top and the bottom. And what's the denominator on the right missing? Being multiplied by X. X on the top and the bottom. So it's exactly the same thing we just did right here, except with letters instead of numbers. So the bottom is XX plus 20. We can just leave that. Now in the top, it's going to be distributive property. What's 30 times X? 30X. So I'm just going to put that there for a second. 30X and 30 times 20. 600. 600. And the last one's not distributive, it's just multiplying. What's 90 times x? 90x. 90x. So what would you get in the top when you combine everything together? 120x plus 600. 120x plus 600. That's the same formula we had before, it's just now combined together. And we're going to need that to do the EBM. So let's, let's do the EBM first. Okay, to do the EBM, you take the highest degree term in the top and divide by the highest degree term in the bottom. But it has to be a single fraction, not two fractions. Okay. What's the highest degree term in the top? Um, 120x. 120x, yeah. And what would be the highest degree term in the bottom? X squared. Right. It would be, if you did it all out, what would it be? It would be x squared. All right. And now, when we reduce that as much as we can, um, what would we end up with for a fraction? 120 over x. 120 over x. Yep. So there's your EDM. And the EBM is used to figure out um, which asymptote. Horizontal. Yep, it's used to find the horizontal. <coughs> Let x get bigger and bigger, and tell me what would happen to what's inside that box. If x gets bigger and bigger, what number does this box approach? Zero. It approaches zero. Yep. And horizontal asymptote? is always y. Okay, that's your horizontal. Um, what other kind of asymptote do we usually find besides the horizontal? Vertical. Yep, the vertical. And the vertical asymptotes are always the values you cannot use in the domain. Does anybody see one number that if you plugged it in, uh, it would not be in the domain? Right, negative 20 is 1, because that would cause you to divide by 0. And there is one other one. Uh, which one? 0, yep. I'm not saying negative 20 makes sense, if you think of this in the context of the train and the car traveling. Negative 20, you can't have that as a speed. But in this problem, this isn't about a word problem. They just asked us to find all this stuff, so we're just finding it. Okay. Um, what else do they want? You got asymptotes. They want to know, I think they said the roots or the zeros. Yeah. Yep. That's the last thing before we graph it. Okay, zeros. The zero is when you set that equal to zero and you solve it. 
So you've got a fraction, and we're <coughs> setting it equal to zero. Just copy it down here. What's the only way that a fraction can ever come out to zero? Well, if the denominator is zero, then you'd be dividing by zero, and that's um, an error. Zero. Yeah. For a fraction to come out to zero, just make the top come out to zero. That, that's all you need to worry about. Um, what would be your first step to solve that? Subtract 600. Yep, subtract 600. And your last step. Yep, divide by 120. 120. And we can cancel out a zero there. What's negative 60 divided by 12? Uh, negative, five. negative 5. And that's where it crosses the x-axis. Negative 5 comma 0. That's everything they wanted. Except um, the sketch, which now we'll do on the calculator. Um, when you sketch it, you could type in the original problem or you could type in the one in red. Um, the one in red is all combined together, so it might, might be less to have to think about. Uh, because it's a fraction, again, make sure you use parentheses. And to avoid an extra set of parentheses, in the denominator, um, I'm going to multiply out x times x plus 20. And I'm going to write it as x squared plus 20x. That's as simple as I think you can type it in. Now, we've got a vertical asymptote at negative 20. So I'm going to go past it so I can see it. I'm going to go to maybe like negative 35. Um, y max, x max. Well, remember, x is the speed of the car. So uh, let's go up to 50. And for y min and max, let's try negative 20 to 20. Oh, let's see how that works. OK, how many vertical asymptotes did we have? Two. 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 So it should give us three sections. And it does. Let's look at that. OK, you're not really seeing. You can definitely see it crosses the x-axis at negative 5. OK, so we got that. Um, you're not seeing that other vertical asymptote at negative 20. So let me go to like negative 50. Oh, wait a minute. Were you already? Oh, yeah, you're seeing it. Never mind, that, that doesn't really give much better of a view. The asymptote at negative 20 is right there. That's negative 20, <coughs> and that's the vertical asymptote at zero, right there. So now, if we look at all three parts of the graph, in terms of the word problem, which part of the graph is the word problem? The left, the middle, or the right? The right? How come? Because it never goes into the negative section. Right. Over here, this is on the negative. Oops. This is the negative part of the x-axis. You can't have negative speed. So algebraically, you can draw that. It doesn't have any meaning in the word problem. Same with this. That's negative speed again. Right. So algebraically, sure. But in the context of the word problem, nope. This, this is the part that we are looking at in the word problem. But they did say to find a complete graph of the whole thing. So for your window, I would write down those numbers. That, that's a good window. Okay. Now next, I'm going to focus on something specifically about the word problem. So we are going to focus in on quadrant one. Okay, but for now, they want the whole thing. Any, um, that, was neg that was negative 50. 
Any questions on that? All right. So now let's let's get this ready to do the word problem. I'm going to focus on quadrant one, which means I should set my x min and my y min to what numbers? Zero. Yeah, let's set those to zero. And there's the part of the graph that was in quadrant one. <clears throat> what this is showing you is x is the speed. So the faster the car goes, the lower it gets on the y-axis, which is the time. So the faster it goes, the lower the time gets. But the time never reaches what? Zero. Yeah, it can never reach zero because you still have to travel the distance and you can't instantly travel from one place to another. Unless you're watching it in the future and we figured that out by now, but not yet. So it still is always gonna take some amount of time to get from point A to point B. It says Sue has two hours to complete the trip. We're gonna, we're gonna do plenty algebraically later on. I just wanna do this one graphically. So find the speed she has to travel by car algebraically. All right. What do you think? I've got to add something to this picture if I want to find the time it's going to take or the speed, sorry, the speed it's going to take for her to do this in two hours. What do you think I'm going to add to my graph? Add a line. line. Yeah, we're going to add a line. Where, where am I going to add a line? At two. I'm going to put a horizontal line at 2. <coughs> OK, I'm also going to set my x max a little higher. I don't know if I need to, but it's going to redraw anyway. So let's just let it redraw. So there's our graph. Uh, I think, yeah, we're going to be fine now. We might have been OK before. I don't know. OK, but now we have a line on our graph, and we have a line at 2. What do you think we want to figure out now? Where they yeah, where they intersect. So second calc intersect. Because they only cross once, you can just hit enter three times. And what do I get for the speed of the car? Yeah, um, let's go to two decimal places just to have it a little more accurate. 46.46. Yes. So it's about 46.46 miles per hour. Now, what if I said to you, what is the speed of the train? If you wrote 46.46, then you got like 90% of the way there and you just messed up one thing. What would the speed of the train be? Yes. Yeah. Right, we know the average speed of the train is 20 faster. <coughs> so when you get to the end, just make sure you're writing down what they want to know. Okay, you solved for x. If you forget what x is, scroll back up. x is the speed of the car, not the train. Okay, so any questions on solving that graphically. So graphically, very straightforward. You're just graphing and finding an intersect. I'd say the hardest thing in that problem is just figuring out the equation from the words. OK, so let's do somewhere I just give you the equation. And we're going to do them algebraically. So uh, i got to just fix this. To solve a rational equation algebraically, you are going to end up multiplying both sides by a variable. Uh, usually. Usually you have to. So then 
solving algebraically, if you multiply both sides of the equation by a variable. This can result in, and then we can just write the rest of it. Can result in an equation that is not equivalent to what you started with. And it's not that you did anything wrong, it's just kind of a side effect when you multiply by variables. What you can end up with is what's called an extraneous solution. It's a solution that should be there, that you created by multiplying both sides of the equation by a variable. And there's no way around that. Okay? You have to multiply both sides by a variable. So what that means is check your answer when you're done and make sure that it works. And I'll show you in a couple examples where um, when you multiply by a variable, everything's fine. And you don't get an extraneous answer. And then I'll, I'll do some where you do. Okay. So if you multiply both sides by a variable, make sure you check your answer. That's the point. So let me, let me show you the, the technique that we're going to do. Uh, but let me do it with all numbers, and then we can try it with a letter. So let's say you had something like uh, x over 3 plus 4 over 5 equals 2x over 15. The only thing that's making that equation a little bit hard to do is all the fractions. If we can get rid of them, then it's going to become a lot easier. To get rid of your fractions, you want to multiply everything by what's called the LCD, the least common denominator. Okay, and I'm going to write that down in a second, the LCD. The LCD is a number that the first denominator, second denominator, and third denominator all divide into without a remainder. So does anybody see a number that 3, 5, and 15 all divide into without a remainder? Yeah? 15, yes. And a lot of times you will notice this pattern that this denominator is the product of the two other denominators before it. If it wasn't, like let's say that was a 16, well, then it gets a little harder. Now you have to find a number that 3, 5, and 16 all go into without a remainder. Okay? But this is 15. Now, uh, I don't want you to think of it as 15. And you'll see why. I want you to think of it as 3 times 5. So we're going to multiply everything in this problem by 3 times 5. 3 times 5, 3 times 5, 3 times 5. And the reason I want you to think of it that way is because something is going to cancel every time. In the first one, x divided by 3 times 3 times 5. What's going to cancel out in the um, first one? The 3s. Thank you. So let's cross the threes out. Okay. In the next one, 4 divided by 5 times 3 times 5. What's going to cancel there? 5's. Five. Five. And then 2x divided by 3 times 5 times 3 times 5. 3 times 5. The whole 3 times 5 cancels out. And look at what you're left with now. 
5x plus 12 equals 2x. This is a very much easier equation to solve than what we started with. So x would be negative 1. So we took an equation that looked like it was pretty complicated because it had all the fractions, and then we found a way to get rid of them, and it made it easy to solve. Now, we do have to check that. Um, well, actually, no, that one we don't have to check because we didn't multiply by a letter. We multiplied by a 3 and a 5. So there is no extraneous solution. The next one will have a letter. So let's try this one. So again, the goal is to eliminate the fractions by multiplying by the LCD. And the hope is going to be that that denominator is the product of the two before it. If it's not, then it starts to get a little bit harder. So let's, let's check that first. What's x times x? x squared. What's x times negative 3? Negative 3x and x times negative 1. So that's negative 3 and negative 1 is negative 4. And what's negative 1 times negative 3? So yes, this denominator on the right is the product of the two on the left. That's good. Okay, so now, this is very similar to this. What do you think we're going to multiply each one of these fractions by? x minus 1 and x minus 3. Yeah. You multiply each fraction by the, the two denominators that you see right away. x minus 1, x minus 3. Do it here. And over here. All right, when you do it in the first one, what is going to cancel out? X minus 1. Yep. Well, what about the second one? X minus 3. X minus 3, X minus 3. That's a minus 1. And what about the third one? The bottom and the things you're multiplying by. Yeah, this is X minus 1, X minus 3. And it cancels that X minus 1, X minus 3. Okay. So now anything you have left is usually multiplication. 2x needs to be distributed. Um, what do you get when you distribute out the 2x? 2x squared plus 2x plus 6x. Minus 6x. All right. Um, Sadie, how about when I distribute out in the next part this positive 1? Just 1x minus 1. The thing that some people make a mistake on here is this symbol goes with the number. If it was a negative, you'd be distributing a negative 1. Okay, but we're distributing a positive 1. So nothing changes. Plus x minus 1. And what's on the other side? 2. Two. At this point, you should now have an equation without any fractions. What's the highest exponent in that equation? 2x plus 3. Uh, just, just that, what is the actual x, the highest exponent? Just the number. 2. 2. And when the highest exponent is a 2, that means you have what kind of equation? Quadratic. Quadratic. Yep. Um, when you are solving a quadratic, you want to get it equal to 0. zero. So let's get it equal to 0. What's negative 6x plus 1x? Negative 5x. Negative 5x. And bring the 2 to the other side. What's negative 1 minus 2? Negative 3. OK. Um, so now we've got a quadratic. 
And what's one way we can <coughs> solve it that's pretty short if the numbers work out nice? Factory. Let's try to factor. What would be my first term in each set of parentheses? So they multiply to give me 2x squared. 2x and x. I've got a negative constant and a negative in the middle. What does that mean? A minus and a plus. Right. We need a minus and a plus, and it does matter which one we put where. Uh, we can try that. If it doesn't work, we'll fix it. Yeah? Plus 1 minus 3. All right, let's try, let's try it. 2x squared minus 6x plus 1x is minus 5x, and 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. Perfect. Okay, so now we factored it. What do we do with each factor? 17. 17. Okay, so if you solve the first one, um, what would you get for x? Mm -hmm. Negative one half. Negative one half, yep. And how about the second one? Three. Now, did we multiply both sides by anything that had a variable? Yes. So we got to check those and make sure they work. Let's check three. So look at your original problem. If you can't read it, I'll just... Just slide these off so you can see them a little better. What would happen if we plug 3 back into the original problem? Um, the second, you would divide by 0. So like 1 divided by x minus 3, you would divide by 0. You divide by 0 in the second one. And where else would you divide by 0? Oh, the other side, yeah, because that's x minus 1, x minus 3. So plugging 3 back in will not work. It causes you to divide by 0, and that is extraneous. In terms of like what I would ask for on the test, I might still ask for that answer. But I would just have a box where you could label it. Is this extraneous, yes or no? And you just say yes for that one. Okay, let's check negative a half. Unless you made a mistake with the math, all you need to check is, does plugging the number back in cause you to divide by zero? That's what would make it extraneous. If you did your math wrong, well, then that's negative a half is definitely wrong. Okay. But does negative a half cause you to divide by zero? No. So then that answer, assuming all the math is right, will work. So that's an example of when you solve a quadratic, you got one answer that works, you got one answer that doesn't. What else do you think could happen when you solve a quadratic besides that situation? Yeah, you can get neither answer works, they're both extraneous, or both could work. Yeah, those are really the three things that can happen, both, none, or one. In this case, it was one. Let's try this one. So again, the first thing you always want to check, if you multiply the two denominators you see first, do you get the other denominator? Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's good. So that means this third denominator doesn't complicate finding the LCD. If you find the LCD of the first two, it's automatically the LCD of the third one. Uh, because of what because they multiply together. What would we multiply everything by in this one? X and X plus two. X, X plus two. Yep. So X, X plus two. X, X plus two. X, X plus two. Okay. What's going to happen in the first fraction? The x's cancel. X's cancel. Second fraction? X plus 2. X plus 2. Third fraction? The whole bottom. The whole bottom. Yep. Okay. Now, the first parentheses, what we have left, that is a um, 
foil. Okay, that all has to be foiled out. Um, what do you get when you distribute all of that out? X squared, yep. Okay, so we're going to get, I'm just going to put that there for a second. Plus 2x. Minus 3x. Minus 3x. So that's going to be minus x and minus 6. Okay, so there's the first one. Um, how about the second one? What, just tell me what you're going to distribute first. Positive right. 3. Positive 3. And when you distribute it, you just get 3x. just 3x. And on the right side, negative just negative 6. OK, so we have another um, quadratic. What's negative x plus 3x? 2x. 2x. And how would you bring negative 6 to the other side? You would add it. That's gone. And that's gone. When your constant disappears, um, the problem just got a lot easier. You're going to have to factor it, but it's going to be a simpler kind of factoring. It's going to be one set of parentheses instead of two. All you can do is factor out the GCF. What's the GCF here? X. X. And what does that leave you with? It leaves you with X, X plus 2. So let's see what's going to happen now. Set each factor equal to 0. When you set the first one equal to 0, you're, you're done. And how about the second one? Let's try to plug 0 back in. What happens when you plug 0 in? You get a 0 in the denominator. In which one? In the first, and x minus 3 over x. Mm -hmm. And also the negative 6 over x squared plus 0. And the other one, right? Because that's, that's also 0. So when you try to plug 0 back in, that's extraneous. And how about when you plug negative 2 back in? It's extraneous. That's also extraneous because it gives you a 0 here and there. So this is a no solution. And there isn't necessarily an easy way to know that when you're just looking at the problem right away. But it is a no solution. Okay, any question on it? But that's the whole key. Multiply all three fractions by the first two denominators that you see. All right, so this is going to lead us into the, the last thing we're looking at. Um, I just want you to read the question first, and then tell me what is different about the kind of answer it's looking for here compared to what we did before. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Anybody see what's different? about the kind of answer you were going to get in this problem. Yep. Um, well, we already know the train is faster. Is that what you were saying? Which one could be faster? So the, the train is still going to be 20 miles per hour faster than the car on average. So whatever the, whatever the rate of the car is, the train is going to be plus 22. But anyone else see what's different about how this one's being asked? Yeah? It's an inequality. It's an inequality. So that's getting us into the, the last thing. It's not asking you how long it takes to complete the trip in exactly two and a half hours. It's saying less than two and a half. So that's the formula we had before. Um, I think I, I still have it typed in. But I need to modify y2. What am I going to put in for y2 this time? Two. Right. I'm going to put in 2 and a half. So you could put the original in. I'm just using the one that's combined together because it was easier for me to type in. Let me hit graph. So there's the time it takes for Sue to make the, the trip. 
There's my line at two and a half. And what, oops, I don't want a circle. What do I want to do now? Yeah, you can use that circle. So find the, find the intersection point. So let's, let's do that. Now the key is going to be though how you write your answer. So find where they cross. That's where they intersect, 34.88. So now, how would you write your answer? Yes, because it says she has to do the trip in under two and a half hours. So we want to know where does the blue line go under the red line. Okay. That's after they cross. They cross at 34.88, so anything past that number. So the speed of the car is greater than 34.88. That's the key, how you write your answer. has to be an inequality. Any question why the speed of the car has to be that number, it has to be higher than that number. If you go slower than that speed, it's going to take you longer. And we can't, we can't be longer than two and a half. Okay. So that's a rational inequality. When we solve rational inequalities, we're going to do them um, on the calculator. When we do the equations, we're going to do them like we did right here. Um, always remember when you are using the calculator, things can be hidden. Hidden can mean that it's off the screen and you need to zoom out to see it. Or hidden can mean you need to zoom in to see something on the screen because maybe it's really small. So you might see some problems, you will see some problems in the homework that tonight that say solve the following inequality using a sign chart. We are not using the sign chart. So any problem that says solve using a sign chart, we're going to solve graphically. Okay, we are always going to solve graphically. problems left, one, two, and that's it. Okay, so everybody clear on that, no sign chart, graphically? Okay. Alright, let's try this one. Alright, it's an inequality, so I said we are definitely going to solve graphically. So what's the, uh, I'm going to solve it graphically, what's the first thing I need to do? Do what? Um, no, you don't need to. The calculator can handle it pretty much the way it is. Graph it. Yeah, you got to graph it. Graph it. Right? If I don't put it in, can't solve it. Um, what am I going to, to type that in, what do I need to use on the calculator that's not written on the board? Parentheses. Right. Okay, I don't need parentheses with it on the board, but when you type it in, you do. So 2x squared plus 6x plus 8, and 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. Okay, so there's the left side. Um, what's going to go on y2? Yep, I'm going to put a 1. And we are going to be looking for where our graph in blue is under the line y equals 1. What kind of line is y equals 1? Horizontal. Yeah. I'm going to start with zoom six and see how it looks. 
Remember, we're looking for where the blue one is under the number one. What I'm going to do is I want to set my x max a little higher just to see if something's happening that I, I think is happening on the right side. So let's watch that red line again on the right side. If I, I don't know if I went far enough. No, not quite. I'd have to go a little further. But that's fine. All right, let me get some blank space. So we're looking for where that graph is under the number one. Well, it looks like it's in three sections. Is the middle section ever under the red line? So we can forget about that. Let's look at the left section. It looks like the left section is under the red line. Let's go to the table. And I want to check further to the left and make sure that it stays under the number one. Okay, negative 2. Um, no, I meant to go negative 20, sorry. Negative 20. Is the blue graph still under 1? Yes. yes. Let's try negative 40. Did the blue graph go up a little bit? Went up a little, but is it still under 1? Yes. So let's try like negative 500. Okay, it went up a little bit more, but is it still under 1? Yeah, so if you're out at negative 500 or even like negative 5,000, if we go to negative 5,000 and it's still under 1, it's probably never going to go above 1. All right, so how far left can I go on this blue section and still have it stay under the red line? Negative infinity. Yep, so I can go negative infinity right up to that line but not including it. I'm going to make that line pretty easy to find. It's not going to be a hard number to, to guess. Where does it look like that vertical asymptote is? Three. All right, let's try negative 3. Yep, that's where it is, because we got an error. So we can go right up to, can we include the negative 3? No, you never include an asymptote. Now. Does the right section look like it's below the red line? Yes. yes, up to a point. I think it's going to cross somewhere in here, but we don't have enough resolution to, to see it. So let's check like two. All right. Is the blue one under the red? Is it under the red one there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, point eight. Let's check ten. Okay. Are we still under the, the red line? No, we went to 1.02. So by 10, we are above the red line. We have to find out where. How am I going to see where the blue one crosses the red one? Yeah, let's do the intersect. It's somewhere in here. It's at 5. Okay, when we get to 5, even though you can't see it, you could zoom in and see it, but the blue one crosses the red one. So 5 is as high as we can go. Don't include it, though, because it says less than. Now, the lowest we can go, right up to that dotted line. If you go past that dotted line, you're going to jump up on the other part of the graph, which we don't want. So we've got to figure out where that dotted line is. Where, um, where does it look like that dotted line is? OK, let's try a half. Yes. So then again, vertical asymptote, it's going to be like an easy number. Like a, at most, it'll be a 0.5. Okay. So we can go right up to 0.5. So that covers everything from 1, 2, 3, 4, from here over to here. It covers that section. Now, can I include the 0.5? No. Why not? It's a vertical asymptote. You can never include an asymptote. If I change this problem to have a line under it, there is only one thing that would change there. It would turn into a bracket. 
which one would turn into a bracket? Only one of them. The, the which one? No, the point 0.5 is still a vertical asymptote, so you never can increase the asymptote. The no, the negative the three is only five. The five. The five. The five. Yes. Because the five is not a vertical asymptote, but the only reason we're not including it is because it's said to stay under and not equal the line. Okay. That's the only thing that would change. So that is that is our answer. Any questions on that before we look at the last one? Yeah. Uh, not with that, but with my calculator. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't edit anything like in the table. So we might have talked about that. Does anybody remember what you have to do to make it so you can edit the table? Second table setup. Second table setup. Mm -hmm. And make sure yours looks just like that. I think I have to send a question. Yeah. And then you can type in whatever you want in the table. Okay, any uh, other questions? Okay, so the last one, uh, it says to find where that is above or equal to 15. This one, the denominator is a little simpler. So where, I, I might ask you on this one, where is the vertical asymptote? Two. Two. So I don't know if that's going to play into our answer at all, but it is something you should be able to tell by looking at it. Okay, so let's graph it. Uh, let's get x to the fourth minus 3x to the third plus 2x squared plus 2. And we're going to divide that by x minus 2. And I don't want 1 on y2. What do I want this time? 15. 15. So standard window, is that... Is that going to work this time? No. no. I would set our y max. I would go to at least like 25. Go a little above it. You could leave the x max on 10. I'm just I left it on 25 because I must have had that from the last problem. Take graph and see what we get. I'm just going to go to the left a little and um, check that out, make sure there's nothing uh, going on over there. So let's set the y min to like negative 25. It's going to make it a little, wait, did I do y min? Um, I meant x min. Let's do x min, negative 25. So I got negative 25 to 25 everywhere now. That's, that's fine. It's going to make it a little harder to see the detail because we're zoomed out. But that was intentional because I'm trying to see what's going on. I don't think there's anything else going on over here. So it seems like we're OK. OK, that's it's not a great window to see it. Um, but does it look like the graph in blue is ever above the red one? Yes. If I draw that a little bit kind of zoomed in, I think it would look something like this. So I basically have two sections that are above the red. This one and this one. Okay. Let's start with this left one. What do we know happens at 2 based on the denominator? Right, because we have a what? Uh, we have a vertical asymptote at 2. So in this left section, you can go from here right up to, but not including there. So it's a very small section. But that is a section where the blue line is, a, the blue curve is above the red. So what's the lowest we can go in this left section? Two. 
Uh, how do we write that though? Yeah. No, fifteen would be like over there more. We want to know the lowest we can go on the x-axis and still stay on that section of the curve. Uh, two, yeah, that's the lowest I can go. If I try to go lower than two, I'm going to pass the vertical asymptote, and now I'm going to be down there. So do not go past the vertical asymptote. Can we include it? No. no. So we can go from two, and then the highest we can go and still stay on this section is whatever that x value is right there. We can't go any higher than that in that section because if we do, we're going to drop below the red line. And we, we don't want to do that. So let's do second calc intersect. Um, I think if you're careful, um, you can do this. Nah, I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in because um, the two intersection points are very close here. And I really need to put my guess closer to the one on the left. And now I think I'm zoomed in enough I can do that. So second calc intersect. Yeah, definitely. OK, so we can go from 2 up to 2.22. Can I include 2.22 or not include it? Include it? Yeah, we can include it. So if you pick any number between 2 and 2.2, you will be above the red line on that section right there. Now I need this section. How can I figure out the lowest I can go on the second part of the U shape. If I know what that means. Yeah, if I go too low, what's going to happen is I'm going to end up down here. So you don't go past that. So find that. And that's the lowest you can go. So you can go all the way down to 2.68. And again, it is a bracket. Because it says we can include it. And now, let's plug in higher and higher x values and see what happens. 10, 20, 40. Does it ever look like it's coming back down to the red line? No, it's, it's just getting higher and higher. Now it's up at 122,000. So it's probably just going to keep going like this. Just that part's just going to keep going up. So the highest I could go is infinity. I could just keep going to the right forever, and it never comes back down. Yep. And it goes up very steep. Okay, by the time you get to like 500, the answer is so big now it's in, well, it's in scientific notation in the, in the table. But eventually, it's, it's even going to be in scientific notation in the bottom. Okay. You plug in a big enough number. too big to display what it is. Right. And that's, that's our answer. So yeah, I don't know if I'd call that hidden. I mean, I can see it dips below the red line. Um, but I did have to zoom in to see it a little bit better. Okay. Any, uh, any question on that? So that's um, section 430. That's the homework on 4.3. So it's 113 odd. And then 20, 22, 24, 28, and 31. Um, so we'll look at that tomorrow. And then the only section we have left this week is 4.4. And the goal is to finish that by Thursday. <coughs>